All right. Um, so when something rough hits you in life, it could be a disease, it could be a tragedy, it could be financial. There's a lot of things, ways that that can happen. It's when the rubber meets the road on your faith, right? That's where you find out how deep your faith really is. It's one thing to say you believe something, but it's at those moments where you get to actually decide if what you believe is true or not. Uh, the, the opportunity is to uh, shake your fist at God and say, how could you do this to me? You clearly aren't strong enough to protect me, or you clearly don't love me enough to, to stop this from happening, or um, why would you do this? And to question his goodness and his character, or you can hold on to your faith, trusting that Somehow this God has this all in control. And even though you can't see it, he's working out all the details in the midst of it. And um, that's kind of what we're left with. We've been studying, again, the book of Daniel. And the whole book is about when the rubber meets the road, right? Because Daniel and his friends are in Jerusalem when their city is destroyed, their king is taken away, their temple is destroyed. They themselves are taken into captivity uh, taken into exile, the rubber is meeting the road on their life, and all the things that they thought they knew about God seem to be collapsing. So is it true, or were those just pieces that they assumed meant that, that you know, because they had a temple, because they, they had a God or a, a king and those kind of things, that he truly was the God who was in control, or can they still trust him even when tragedy strikes? So as we've been going through, we've been hearing, uh, studying the idea that Yahweh is indeed sovereign. So in chapter 1 in 605 BC, Nebuchadnezzar attacks Jerusalem, takes thousands of these young boys away from their families so that he can brainwash them to the Babylonian way. Chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar's on the throne uh, again, and he begins having a terrifying dream about this giant image or idol uh, that is made of different metals, and uh, they eventually are destroyed. And I, I just want to say as a subtext to this, that the, the, the piece of this that we need to remember is that it's always bad to confuse your religion with your politics. And this that plays out through this book in the whole time because you see kings and emperors uh, confusing themselves as gods and setting themselves up as gods and people confusing their empire as something that is holy. And uh, all of that gets thrown away because ultimately God is the only one who's king and his empire is the only one that endures. So Daniel interprets Nebuchadnezzar's dream. And we find in that dream, this thing that scripture calls the time of the Gentiles. And there's these four kingdoms that are introduced beginning first with Babylon and uh, we told we're told that Babylon is the first empire and there's a uh, as it goes through down the the body through each of the kingdoms we get and we discover this time gap that's there between um actually I don't think there we go there we go. this time gap that's there uh, at the ankles and uh and the statue ends with this uh, the toes, which is a Rome 2.0, a future Rome, not a historic Rome from our perspective, but a future Rome that doesn't hasn't existed yet. And the coming Antichrist that is uh, trying to set up a kingdom over and against God. Daniel ends chapter 7 with uh, verse 28. Here's the end of the matter. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts were greatly alarmed me and my color changed, but I kept the matter to myself. He is so shocked that it is uh, making his, you know, the color in his face change. He's, uh, he, he didn't tell anybody he's about to faint with this. Nebuchadnezzar also had a very troubling dream in chapter two and chapter seven. Uh, Daniel has the dream. We discover that later. And these things are so terrible that are going to happen that both of them are deeply troubled by all of this. Um, it's troubling to the non-believer, uh, to King Nebuchadnezzar, and it's troubling to the believer, as we see in Daniel. Old Daniel is shaken by this, because remember when in chapter 7, he uh, is 50 years older than he was as a child, so it's uh, older Daniel at that point. So we, we, we talked about those two chapters, chapter 2 and 7, because those visions are linked, and they're part of that chiasm that is present in Scripture in many places, 
but specifically in the book of Daniel. As Daniel was writing this, there's this chiasm that he creates. It's a layered sandwich, basically. And uh, the things that are uh, opposite ends are uh, equal to each other. So you have the trial in uh, chapters three and six. You have pride in chapter four and five. And you have the dreams that we talked about in chapters two and seven. And the thing that's in the center is the thing that's the most important. And that is uh, the concept of God's in control. And will we let go of our pride enough to allow him or not to rule? So now we're going to travel back again. Oops. Let me go back to oh, wrong direction. Sorry. Uh, back again. Oh, I think I deleted one of the slides. Oh, well. All right. We're going to go. Oh, there we go. There we go. We're going to go back again. Uh, actually, this is right. This is what happens when I don't get enough sleep. So uh, we're going to travel back in time and back again, 50 years previous to chapter seven, to the young Daniel after the king's vision. And it says in Daniel chapter two, verses 48 and 49, the king gave Daniel high honors and many great gifts and made him the ruler over the whole prince of Babylon and the chief prefect over all the wise men in Babylon. Think about this, this 18 year old, 16 year old exile gets put over in charge of all the locals. And this is going to cause problem as we get into the next chapter. Verse 49 says, Daniel made a request to the king and he appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel remained at the king's court. So they're not serving in the same places. They're serving in separate places, which sets us up for chapter three because Daniel is not present in chapter three. He writes it, he experienced, he knows what happened, but he's not the one, he wasn't present when it ha happened. So the young men are in separate locations as we continue. But then I want to get to, okay, there's the timeline uh, that we're going into. Uh, as we see that we're, when chapter seven and eight, we're in 544 mm -hmm. BC. Now we're traveling back in time up to chapter three. And Daniel's 33, 36 years old at that time compared to he was in his 70s when, uh, when it happened before. And when we opened the book, so chapter one, he's he's uh, 13 years old. Chapter two, he's 16, 18 years old. Chapter three, he's in his 30s. Does that make sense as we go from there? And um, in chapter seven, we had those three more kingdoms that are added to the story because there's only the chapter two with four beasts. We've added three kingdoms. So there's seven kingdoms that are going to come along before Rome 2.0 comes along. So as we move into, we talk about chapter three, that gap in between, um, the scripture doesn't really give us much time uh, how that, we can't tell from there when that happened. But when I say it's uh, 15 to 20 years later, it's because the Septuagint tells us from uh, Jewish tradition that it's there's a time gap. It really doesn't matter, except it makes a little bit more sense that a little bit of time has passed. So there's a a time gap that happens in between there, between chapters two and three. So again, we're about 580, 585 BC at that point. Does that make sense? Yeah. All kind of silent and kind of looking, yeah. trusting that that's going to be it. With that, we're going to move to Daniel chapter three. So open your Bibles or your digital devices, whatever works for you. King Nebuchadnezzar verse one, made an image. I'd like for you to start highlighting or underlining that word in your script, in your uh, whatever you use, because um, this chapter particularly, it's very interesting because we're gonna see a ton of repetition. Probably 75% of the passage is repeated over and over and over again in different forms. One of the things that's repeated is this word uh, image that's going to be repeated 10 times in this passage. And uh, it's all important. Uh, there's two reasons why it happens. Uh, one reason, it's it's a Babylonian literary style, which is fascinating because now, which makes sense, Daniel has been living in the Babylonian Empire for 20 years, ruling in the empire, and he's using their literary style to communicate this. Remember, this is not written in Hebrew. This part of the book is actually written in Aramaic. It's not written in Hebrew. Um, so the other thing that's important is because when things are re repetitious, you don't pay attention to them. So that when you don't, when there's something that's not part of the repetition, it highlights uh, how important that is as, as we go along. 
So pay attention to that. But I would start uh, writing the word, uh, highlighting the word image, because image is the, it's the same word in chapter two, when he had the vision of this, he, we call it the statue. It was really, uh, the word is Selem, which means uh, it was an idol. So what um, Daniel was talking about in the vision was the idol of political power that was there. And the same thing is now happening in, in this chapter. We're also going to see this image that's going to be a statue, but it's really an idol, and it's a political idol. Uh, so again, the warning against mixing our religion and politics and, and how that happens in the same way. Um, so again, the young men are in their 30s. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits and its breadth was six cubits. So the image itself um, is, a, a cubit is 18 inches approximately. So it's at least 90 feet tall and about nine feet wide, which proportionately uh, we are, a, 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 a human is typically about 10 to one. You know, your, your size to your width is about 10 to one. And this is uh, three to one, uh, sir, I, I'm sorry. A human is normally two to one but this one is 10 to one. So it's very tall and skinny. So it's it's not very proportionate in it as it goes, which is not terribly important, but just visually as you see that. Um, again, 20 years prior to this vision, Nebuchadnezzar had this terrifying vision of another icon, another idol, another image. Uh, and the statue had a head of gold, which Daniel tells him in the interpretation, you are the head of gold, which is very, affirming to him that he's the most valuable, he's the top, uh, but your kingdom is not going to last. It's going to be replaced by these more inferior kingdoms. Well, after 20 years of, of that being taking place, Nebuchadnezzar's like, no, I'm, I'm going to make my kingdom last. I'm This whole statue is, is going to continue. I'm going to be gold. I'm the gold statue. So he's going to, his confidence has been restored that maybe Yahweh doesn't have the power and maybe that dream wasn't as important as I thought it was 20 years ago. And so he's going to make a statue kind of as a proclamation that uh, you think you're in charge, Yahweh, or Daniel, your God may be the one that you, you says is in charge, but I'm enduring. My kingdom's lasting. It's 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 going to stick around for a while. So uh, this dream clearly had an impact on him as he makes this uh, new statue. And um, statues... Even in Rome, you see their power statements, right? They would have the emperors would have their statues put all over the place. Um, the, the most egotistic uh, emperors had the most statues. It's almost a, a statistic comparison. You can see the ones that had the biggest egos were the ones who had the most statues made of themselves and put in all the places. And it's always a political statement of who has power, who's in charge. Don't forget that I'm the one that's in control at the time. And it was, you know, it's kind of like a dog marking its territory. I, I put a statue in your backyard means I'm the one that rules your backyard. Uh, uh, so he set up the statue, the icon, the image in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Babylon means, uh, Dura means the fortress. So it's the, the plain of the fortress. So it's in the plain that is around Babylon in that area. Verse two, the king Nebuchadnezzar sent to the gather the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the councils, the treasurers, the magistrates and all the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image on the line, number two, that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So there's lots of, this whole fragments of this are going to be repeated over and over and over again. Uh, again, it, it, as you're doing it, you think you're making a 90 foot statue of gold. Uh, you're going to make a base to put it on. And you have this massive empire that all of your leaders have to come to. So this is time. This isn't something that happens overnight. This takes time to set up. It takes time to send invitations. It takes time to, for people to get there. It takes time to make this statue. And then all that takes time as it goes. Then he repeats verse two again. The satraps, the prefects, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of all the provinces gathered for the dedication of the image, again, that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Again, there's that uh, repetition that um, it's called the list genre actually is how that goes. So when you see the list genre, it's a Babylonian style specifically. And um, it says they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up 
And the herald proclaimed aloud, you are commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, this will be repeated as well, that when you hear the sound of the horn, the pipe, the lyre, the trigon, the harp, the bagpipe, see even Scots were there, and every kind of music, you are to fall down and worship uh, the golden image, there it is again, that King Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into the burning fiery furnace. I guess the Irish have taught bagpipes too, so I should include the Irish there as well. <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar is trying to unify his empire under one religion. This is, he, he wants everybody to bow down to this specific icon, which represents his kingdom, his power, and his authority. <clears throat> Again, uh, he's trying to force them to do that. And this is the difference between religion and love, because religion is merely a, an external set of uh, things that you do for uh, a religion. It's it's not a choice. You could do it without paying attention even. But what God wants from us is a relationship with him where we choose to follow him. And so uh, Satan isn't concerned about your heart. He's just concerned about conformity. And that's what um, all of these kingdoms will be about. Therefore, as soon as all the peoples heard the sound of the horn, the pipe, the trigon, the harp, the bagpipe, and every kind of music, all the peoples, all the nations, all the languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. It kind of sounds like a Dr. Zeus tale almost. It's, you know, mm -hmm. the repetition that's there. Therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward, maliciously accused the Jews. So a couple words that we need to... Does, does your word say Chaldeans there? Does your version say Chaldeans? All right, which is good because a lot of them will just merely say the Babylonians or or that some will say the Magi or the magicians or stuff like that. The word is Chaldeans. And the reason that, what's that? Which verse? We're in verse eight. And the reason that's important is because the Chaldeans are the locals. These are the guys that, that this is their empire to start with. But guess what happened? When Daniel got put over them, a 16 to 18 year old exiled prisoner boy becomes in charge of all of us who this is our empire. And so they're not happy with the fact that this happened. And he brings his other three friends. They also have favor and power and authority. So it's important to understand it's not just the magi or the magicians. It's the locals that are um, the ones that are frustrated with this. The other word that is there is Jews. Most of us say have it says Jews there and that's really kind of a cultural modern version of what it was really the Judeans it because it was the the kingdom of Judah that was taken into exile and it was so it was the Judeans that's there and that the slang for Judeans or Judit is uh what we call Jews it, so Jews is really a slang term but that word also gets uh, pulled into the New Testament. And so instead of hearing uh, the word, uh, when we say the word Jews, we're thinking of Jews in general instead of the Judeans, those who have political and religious power that comes from Jerusalem. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So that will make a difference. In it. So it's really the Judeans. And this is where interpreters often in the language, in the translations that we use, they, they translate what common culture uses or things like that, but then we lose the sense of really what the passage is, is trying to say. So these Chaldeans declared to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, the pipe, the lyre, the trigon, the harp, the bagpipe, and every kind of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. That's number seven. And whoever does not fall down and worship it shall be cast into the fiery furnace. Um, they 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 didn't just want punishment. They wanted these guys dead. They wanted them gone. And so uh, there are certain Jews uh, you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, uh, verse 12. Again, it repeats what was back in, in the beginning. But again, why are these guys so malicious? It's because the locals have lost these foreigners, have uh, taken over control. And they're not respecting our culture. They're not respecting our uh, our gods, they're not respecting our religion, and they have authority over this. And it, this is really causing them uh, some anxiety. And so for the past 20 years, they've been looking for a way to get rid of these guys. And here's a way that this can happen. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these men, O, o King, pay no attention to you. 
they do not serve your gods or worship the image that you have set up. So they're making it very personal that, that, that this disrespect is very personal against uh, its defiance against the king. Verse 13, then Nebuchadnezzar in a furious rage commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. So he brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image, number nine, that I have set up? He knows their names. Did you notice that? Uh, he, these, are, these are guys he put in power. He should know their names. They're, he's given them authority. They're Daniel's friends. Uh, and, but he doesn't give time for them to answer. He doesn't give them a chance to say, is it true? He just automatically changes and gives them a second chance, which means there's something in him that wants it not to be true. Uh, so he automatically says, now, if you, when you are ready and you hear the harp, uh, the sound of the harp, the lyre, the trigon, the harp, bagpipe, uh, and every kind of music to fall down and worship before the image number 10 that I have made uh, well and good. But if you do not worship you shall immediately be cast into the burning fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hand? Sounds like a challenge to me, right? At that point, who is the God? Nebuchadnezzar has set himself up. He's already saying, I don't believe that the vision that I had 20 years ago, two years ago is going to come into power. Look at me. I'm still in power. I haven't lost my throne. Uh, God does not have the power that you think he is. So who is going to deliver yourself? And he lays down a challenge that God actually delivered them out of the furnace. So we know the, how the story goes. Verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you, uh, you in this matter. This is the definition of God is gracious, so I don't have to prove myself. This is the definition of that. This could be the theme first for that passage. Uh, there's, there's no question for them as to what they're supposed to do. Verse 17, if this be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fire of furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. They believe that God is, is going to do that. For them, this is the rubber hitting the road at the end of it. They, they, they're they not sweating at this. They believe that God is going to deliver them. Uh, but what if he doesn't? Verse 18, but if not, even if, however your scripture verse says that, even if he doesn't, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods, or worship the golden image, number 11, that you have set up. So this comes down to each of us in terms of, if God doesn't answer your prayers the way you want to, does that mean he doesn't love you? Does that mean he can't answer the prayer that you want to? If it's not going your the way you want it to, does that mean he is any less in control than he was before? Uh, so, but what if he doesn't? Because here's the bottom line. Fire is a real option for all of us. And maybe not real fire, but it could be financial fire. It could be health fire. It could be, there's, there's a lot of ways. There's a lot of furnaces that each of us could be thrown into. And if we're thrown into that furnace, again, it's a real option. It could be persecution. It could be a real furnace because we know in the end times, it will be a real furnace. They had faith and courage despite the fire. Verse 19. The Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury, and the expression on his face changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And he ordered the furnace heated seven times more than he had usually heated it. His countenance had been of compassion and, and, and a second chance, and now he's so frustrated, so angry at them. Mm. This is a typical beast empire move at this point. This is what a, a, a person who has succumbed, as we saw in the video before, to the wilds of the beast. This is the response that they would have. For 20 years, I have given you guys favor and power and authority and a role in my kingdom. And this is the way you're going to thank me. You're going to, in front of the entire, every ruler in the kingdom, you're going to ignore me. You're going to disrespect me in this way. I'm trying to unify my empire. I'm trying to do good things. And here you are ripping it out from underneath my feet. So he is, his pride has totally been wounded. Verse 20 says, and he ordered some of the mighty men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I think it's very interesting in the repetitious manner of this that, that every he doesn't say, he doesn't say, that, and he bound the men or he talked to the men or he called the men. It's always Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That's part of the repetition of this passage. He's repeating their names to cast them into the burning furnace. He's not going to take any chances. He had the, the, uh, the biggest 
burliest guys in his army, tie these guys up. He's not just going to throw them in. He's tying them up to throw them in. Here, here's an interesting thing. In their coats. In their coats. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 says what? Faith is the evidence of things unseen, right? So somehow there's a little fear in Nebuchadnezzar that the faith of these men mm -hmm. is evidence of something that is real. Huh. And so he's not taking any chances. He has them bound up. Then these men were bound in their cloaks, in their tunics, in their hats, in their other garments. They didn't take time. Let me take off my gloves or anything. They just bound them up, wrapped them up. All of that was included. They were dressed for a political event. They had all their finery on when they went in there. And they were thrown into the fiery furnace. Because the king's order was urgent and the furnace was overheated, the flame of the fire killed these men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So hot that it kills... As you're throwing somebody in, I mean, it's got to be pretty hot. I mean, if something's hot and you're throwing something, you get, you have time to back off. It was so hot that as they threw it out, they didn't even have time to, to pull off, the, to get out of there. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, in case you'd forgotten what their names were, <laughs> fell into the burning, fiery furnace. The end. Now what? No. No. Not at all. It should be, right? Humanly would be, that would be the end of the story. Right. Verse 24, then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished. He rose up in haste and he declared to his counselors, did, did we not cast three men bound into the fire? And they answered and said to the king, true, O king. And he answered, but I see four men and they're unbound, walking in the midst of the fire. And they are not hurt. Do you see how many things he's noticing in there? <laughs> so they were, their ropes were burned. So the only way they could be walking is if the ropes were burned off. So the, the ropes are gone at that point. They're walking around. Uh, they're not hurt. And the appearance of the fourth of one is like the son of the gods. What's another word to say that? The image. The image of the gods. He had set up an image of himself as a God to be worshiped. And guess who shows up? The image of God himself shows up in the midst of the burning fire. Colossians chapter one, verse 15 says, Jesus. yes. Like a son of the gods. There's no definitive article before the song. Like the son of God. That's the mistranslation. Well, it's, it, it, it's, uh, there is no definitive, definitive article there, so that wouldn't be there typically, but it'd be interesting. What version is that? New King James. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. There is no definitive article there. So the the isn't there. I think that's why the modern ones are saying uh, A instead of A, son of the gods. Yeah. So have like capital S, capital G, words? No. Nope. All right. So what I sort of read ahead, and that surprised me, was that the king, that the king, would like recognize Jesus for who he is, mm -hmm. saying that, calling him that, right? Yep. yep. So then when you read it differently, so thank you. I yeah. No, so that's important because again, our tra our translations sometimes import uh it is true, and I will say that it is Jesus that's there. So what they're doing is saying what we know is true, we're gonna import right. into what the passage says. But it did quote oh, yes. Uh, the king saying it, who couldn't necessarily make that assumption. Yeah. So, and Jesus isn't the son of the gods. He is the son of God, right? right. So, but he is. I so, what, what, what uh, Nebuchadnezzar did recognize was there's something inhuman about this fourth person, yeah. which of course we would say is Jesus, mm -hmm. and or what we would call an epiphany. Mm -hmm. And the epiphanies happened in the Old Testament mm -hmm. in the burning bush. Mm -hmm. Right, mm -hmm. it appeared in the fire that was over the people that led them Jacob's through life. the wilderness. Right, right? The and there was well, that was a vision. Oh. So, an epiphany is an actual physical thing that happens when so the angels that appeared to Abraham that's an epiphany. Uh, that's when uh, that happens. So, there's there's other places on Mount Sinai when Jacob did, Jacob did, did uh, but. I thought, sorry, I thought you meant on the first time around. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, that would be an epiphany as well. Um, there are different places when, when that happens. Um, the Holy Spirit appears in an epiphany at the day of Pentecost over the as tongues of fire over the people, right? That's an epiphany. This is one of those places where an epiphany happens 
and, and everybody sees that uh, in, in the fire. So we need to recognize that it's something more than just, there's not just another human in there. He's recognizing that there's some, because the other guys, they didn't drag the other guys out of there. Their bodies are still there. They're probably roasting. It probably smells like a decent barbecue at that point. But in the midst of that, one of them didn't get up. I guess that's what you want to know is that one of those other guys that fell didn't walk up and join the other three. This is someone different that's walking in the midst of the fire. That's that's there. And because they must, the, the King James say, and the form of the fourth yep. is like the son of man. Yes. And, yeah. and yeah, the appearance. And mine says the appearance. Anybody else use a different word? Yeah, so it's 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 there. Um, it's interesting that in the the other passage we talked about, it talks about the son of a uh, son of man, so someone with a human appearance, and in this passage we're talking like a son of God, someone with God's appearance that comes. How come they use that son? I mean, why would you go down there and say it's God? Yeah, so. Um, the uh, lots of reasons the partially because and this is the way when we talk about uh for example mary being the mother of god what we're not saying is mary birthed deity what we're saying is jesus had a human body and so when we say jesus was the son of man we're saying he was human and so when when that phrase it's the son of means that he's he's one of us it's not you know something that came out of nowhere he's one of us and so the same thing is true the sons of god is a a common phrase or sons of the gods is a common phrase for not human but part of the deified council of gods that's out there that pagan religions would believe in so it's it's one of them may not be we don't know which one but it's one of them does that make sense? Yeah. yeah when you say plural signs. Same, he, yeah. he, didn't, he didn't know about Jesus Christ at this point. No. Nobody did. No. So why is he saying no. the son of God? Yeah. The no. Of, yes. Of, of yes. Yeah. One, it's a it's a common phrase. Yeah. It is not a specific. And that's we interpret that because we know Jesus says that. In 600 years, he's going to call himself the son of man or the son of God. Yeah. They wouldn't have known those things. Yeah. And so they would not have heard the same way. But he's using phrases they did, and he's he's using them to claim things about himself. So is that so? Since they used those terms, is that why those terms were used later on? I think God is is impregnating the languages of peoples <laughs> in order to to help us understand who He is. Yes. Yeah. So um, yeah, all of all of that's yeah, right. that's important. Verse 26, then Nebuchadnezzar came to the near to the door of the fire, the burning fiery furnace. A little repetition there, burning fiery furnace. Mm -hmm. but, you know, if it's fiery, it's burning. If it's burning, it's fiery. Uh, yeah, repetition. Uh, and he declared Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego again, in case you forgot their names. Servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. Um, even before they come out, he has already recognized yeah, exactly. this is this is beyond this is these are this is the most high god that yeah, is yeah. you know he tried yeah. to unify his his empire under worship and yet in the midst of it he ends up giving glory to god in the midst of it then shadrach meshach and abednego again in case you forgot who they were came out from the fire and the satraps the prefects the governors and the king's counselors gathered together and saw that the fire had not had any power what are we talking about this is the king's authority his power was represented by the fire. He used his fire to prove, I am more powerful than your God. No God. Remember he said, who's the God who can deliver you? And so the fire was, you know, it doesn't say the fire didn't burn him. It says the fire had no power. So the fire was representative of Nebuchadnezzar's well, power. Later on, they said no, no power. Uh, I'm not saying it doesn't say it at all, oh, but okay. he, he, we okay. could have skipped it. But he specifically mentions that it has no power. Over the bodies of these men, the hair of their heads was not set. You know, if, if they had come out completely fine, but with no hair, I would have called it a miracle, right? They could have come out with 
buck naked with no clothes on, everything burned off them, but they were still alive out of that fire. The, the other guys died. It still would have been a miracle. But their hair, probably the most delicate part of their bodies was still there. And their clothes were still, if they had come out with their hair, but no clothes, I would have called it a miracle. But they also had their clothes. If they had come out with smelly clothes, smelling like fire, but they still were dressed and the, the ropes were burn, or were off their arms, and they were completely fine, I would have called it a miracle. But their clothes didn't even smell like fire. Uh, and they were not unharmed, nor was the smell of smoke upon them. Mm -hmm. Each level was, well, they still could have been a miracle, but God went beyond and beyond and beyond and beyond to prove who had the power in that situation. Only uh, The only way they could walk out of there was if the ropes were burned. It was close, but not too close. Can you imagine if you were in that fire? And, and, and first of all, you think you're just going to, you know, the guys just that threw you in there just died. because So you're going to like, it's any minute. It's kind of like, I don't know if you've been in a car wreck or in a place almost in a car wreck or something. And it's like, it's almost like time slows down. I wonder if when they were in there, they were kind of like seeing the guys die and seeing the flames and close around them and thinking, time's slowing down. Any second now, I'm going to feel it. Any second now, my hair is going to burn. Any second. And as they see the flames are burning through the ropes, oh, here it comes. Oh, here it comes. It's gonna... It never happens. It never gets there. It never, it never happens. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to uh, blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, in case you forgot their names, who has sent his angel, delivered his servants, who trusted in him and set aside the king's command. They yielded up their bodies rather than to serve and to worship any God except their own God. Therefore, I make a decree to any people, nation, or language that speaks anything against God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, in case you forgot their names shall be torn limb from limb and their houses laid in ruins and there is no other way which God is able to rescue. No other God who is able to rescue in this way. This guy likes extremes. He could have just said, you know, go pay a fine or I'll throw him in jail. No, I'm going to kill him. I'm going <laughs> to, but that's the way of the dragon. And that's the way, the way of the beast that they, they like to, to work. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, in case you forgot the, forgot the names, in the province of Babylon. So, now what? First of all, and again, I'll say this over and over, and this is a huge lesson for us. It's dangerous to mix the make idols out of our politics and our politicians. Mm -hmm. uh, religion and politics can work together, mm -hmm. but you have to be very careful yes, yes. to not mix them. There is a distinction between the two realms, and we have to be careful of that. Um, Nebuchadnezzar thought that he could thwart God's plan in the end. He thought he could prove that he had the power, he had the authority. I think something that's interesting as we pay attention to this, we've talked about the chasm. Human history is a chasm. It begins in a garden, it ends in a garden. Jesus' death and resurrection is in the very center of all of that. The time of the Gentiles opens with a uh, with idols and the placement of an idol and the end with the placement of an idol at the abomination of desolation Revelation chapter 13 uh, there will be persecution in the midst of that and this is what uh, when we see the persecution that they experienced at the beginning is what the persecution is going to be like at the end there will be fiery furnaces uh, at the other end of all this and we just pray that we won't be alive during those days it's going to be a terrible terrible time but we need to be prepared. Jesus says in John 15, 19, if you were of this world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the world, uh, the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know him who said. So in the midst of, there are very real persecutions, but there are also very real trials that are not persecutions. And that's some of the health trials, the financial trials, the relationship trials that we all go through. And as that comes, um, you may not get the answer that you are hoping for. Remember, God always answers prayers. So yes, if you get your yes, we'll get it. Uh, it may be uh, later, or it will be something that is meant. God never says no to your prayers. So do you believe that in the midst of your trials, that Jesus is with you, that he walks with you, that you are not alone in the midst of it? 
There is a fiery furnace, unfortunately, at the end of all of this. And God's people will be saved from it. And our job is to live in obedience until that time. Father, it is a, a an awesome, and I focus on awe, it's an awesome thing to think about those times. What the end will be like. The terror that some people will go through and it is um, sobering for sure, but I can see how both Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar would have been terrified by what they saw. But thank you that you give us hope and peace and a path with Jesus. Be honored in us, Father. Help us to live in obedience to your Jesus' name. Thank you.